So this is what we're going to do today. Last time we talked about the setup of a specific problem, which I said is going to be related to your homework. Homework will be online this afternoon, the first homework. And we're going to talk about implementing the shooting method on that specific problem. Okay, so last time what we had done, we had written the problem as the following. Here was what our problem looked like. We had written it as a system where the vector x was equal to psi of n d psi of n dx, two components. And we called these x1, x2. So this was the problem formulation that we had come up with last time in class. And what we're going to do here in class today is going to be a simpler version of what you're going to have to solve in the homework. If you look at last lecture, we also developed the boundary conditions, which just said that the solutions had to go to zero at plus and minus infinity. And then we were able to actually calculate what these boundary conditions look like. Okay? Here we're going to do something more simple than that so that we can implement this thing. What we're going to require for the boundary conditions is that at x equals 1, that we have the following. That. We're going to pin it. The solution is 0 at 1. <coughs> also, at negative 1. So these are simplified boundary conditions. This is very important. So I've often had people write code, and they, they basically do the boundary conditions we do in class today. These are the wrong boundary conditions for the homework. This is just a simple example to illustrate how to do it your job partly is to then implement the, the more difficult boundary conditions. Okay? Those are the boundary conditions. Notice that we're on the interval 1 to negative 1. That's going to be important. And we're going to do one more simplification. So, so these are all simplifications. One is that. The second one is that n of x is just equal to a constant. Remember that in what we talked about in class last time there's actually some kind of there's some kind of shape in there. Here we're just going to say it's constant, n zero. Okay, and we'll play around with what n zero is. So that's the problem formulation. These boundary conditions, that solving that problem. Okay, now a couple things to keep in mind. If you go back to the original problem, which I think I may, may have erased here, uh, we knew a couple facts. So first of all, let's go back to the problem now that we have to solve. So now we're going to solve this problem with 0, 1, beta of n minus n naught 0. Okay, a couple things we said before. First, beta n had to be what? Had to be positive. And that still holds here. And the reason the beta of n has to be positive is because that's the only way we're going to get, be able to get solutions that actually can go to zero. Otherwise, they're going to be oscillate. I mean, so outside here we said that beta of n was equal to zero. Otherwise, you've got these oscillations at plus or minus infinity. So it turns out that we're going to stick with that. So we know that. Okay. Now, a couple other things. To, uh, we're actually going to show that if now here here's another observation to make. This here, this is now constant. You can actually solve this system of differential equations fairly simply. And the solution to this is what you do is you plug in a solution of this form like that. And then what you get is lambda v is equal to zero. Uh, um, this is what you end up getting. And this turns out to be an eigenvalue problem. So you get And the way 
you find the solutions to this, the eigenvalues, is you take the determinant of this thing and set it to zero. The reason you do that, because if the determinant of this thing is not zero, then this matrix has an inverse. If it has an inverse, then you can just say, okay, V is equal to that inverse times zero, which is zero. And you want V that's not zero. V is zero is a, you, I could have given you that solution right up here. Is zero a solution? Sure. It's not very interesting. I want something that's not zero. So in order to do that, I have to make the determinant that's not zero, which gives me lambda squared minus and let me just show you what these conditions are um, gives me my two eigenvalues look something like this now here's the important observation that I'm going to make about this Okay, so it turns out in this case, I can actually solve this problem uh, analytically. But we're going to do a computational method because what we're going to do is move on to a, a, a problem where you can't necessarily solve it as easily analytically. Okay, so right now we can solve it analytically, but big deal. The important in observation to make about this is concerning this here. Beta of n minus n naught. What if beta of n is bigger than n naught? This is, we know it's positive. So if this thing is positive, but it's bigger than n naught, then this thing becomes, in here, this is bigger than naught, so I have something bigger than this subtracting. So this thing's positive. The square root of a positive number is positive number. So my two solutions are like e to the plus or minus something, positive numbers. We'll put it in here. My solution was e to the lambda t. So I either have exponential growth or decay because this is either a positive value or a negative value, depending upon these signs here. The important observation to make is, if I have something that is exponential growth or decay, can it ever meet these boundary conditions? The boundary conditions say that at negative 1 and 1, the solution is 0 here and 0 here. So how does an exponentially growing solution, which maybe satisfy this one, ever satisfy that? It can't. You need a solution that somehow does something and can come back down over there. Exponentials do not make turns. Okay? That's observation. So, right there, that's going to rule out the fact that you can't have uh, can't do that. No, not n zero. <laughs> so, right? It's a little early morning for humor, I realize, but I try. Like I said, so you can't have this because if you have this, that means you have exponentially growing or decaying solutions, which there's no way they can satisfy the boundary condition. So I know that beta of n can't be bigger than this. I know beta of n is bigger than zero. So my beta n then would seem to have to be in the range. 0 to n naught. Does that make sense? Well, let's look at it here. Here's my eigenvalues. If beta of n is between 0 and n naught, then what's this quantity in here? Beta of n is smaller than n naught, so this whole quantity here is negative. Square root of a negative number gives you imaginary components. So you have e to the i stuff here. <laughs> e to the i. Well, e to the i is nothing more than cosines and sines. Cosines and sines can, in fact, do things like this or like this. That's a sine. That's a cosine. You can imagine that, in fact, then, oh, I, I can put sines and cosines in here pretty nicely because they turn. So if they start at negative 1, they can end at 1, be 0 at 1 also. The exponentials can't. Okay. So this is an observation about the boundary conditions. By the way, this observation will hold in your homework, too. Those are the only values you can do for the beta. All right. So remember, we're considering a simplified problem. We're going to solve this problem right here with these boundary conditions. And we know that we have to work with beta values in between 0 and n naught. Now, that's one issue. 
The other question we can ask then is, what about the algorithmic setup of what we want to do here? What I want to calculate in this problem is the first five beta values that solve this problem and the corresponding eigenfunctions. Eigenvalues, eigenfunctions that go with this problem. Okay? So I'm going to have a for loop. A for loop which is going to take me through the first five beta values. That's the outside loop. Okay? So I have one for loop for that. Now, as I go through this for loop, through the beta values, inside that for loop, I'm going to start looking for each one of these beta values. And I'm going to have to start doing maybe what's called a bisection method. I'm going to start looking for these things. I'm going to have to start searching around for them. I'm going to have another loop that's going to have to go through an iterative cycle to try to pin down what this beta n has to be. We're going to build one. We have to adjust this beta n to actually make the solution work. This is a lot like our shooting method, right? The shooting method says adjust this launch angle, right? Adjust the launch angle until I hit the target. Here, adjust the beta n until I hit the target and find five values of this that make this work. Okay, so it's two for loops already. One for adjusting the beta, and then another one for taking me for the five different beta values. And then within this, I have to have some if statements. I have to ask, if I haven't hit the target, how do I adjust it? And then I have to also have one more if statement saying, if I actually did hit the target or came within some specified amount, stop the algorithm. Okay? So this is what we're going to develop today. I brought my laptop. We're going to write a little code. It's actually uh, in your notes as well. So uh, whatever I do here, we're going to get this code working. You can see how the program flows go. Then you can go back and uh, play with it on your own computer. Now the final question before we dive into that is, is the following. This problem, I can actually calculate an exact solution. Suppose I was starting from scratch on a problem that didn't have an exact solution. You can ask the following question. I get a result. How do you know it's right? Fundamentally, you better understand that that is going to be very important for what you do. Most computational codes, when you're running them, people don't know necessarily what the answer is going to be. It's not like the answer in the back of the book where I, oh good, I can match it up with this picture, I did it right. How much confidence do you have in your code when you run it? You get a result. You think it's interesting. Maybe you think it's right. What makes you confident enough to not only think it's right, but know it's right, to publish it in a paper for everybody in the world to see? And you know you're not wrong. Okay? That's very important because this is the thing you need to be able to understand for coding is that anybody who gets a result, you have to be, have a certain confidence that you actually are getting the right thing. There's a lot of numerical errors that give you things that don't make the code blow up, but they generate certain things in the code that are completely fake. Numerical artifacts. How do you know it's what you're seeing is not one of those? Okay? So, typically, people do what are called convergent studies. And you're going to do one for homework one. Here's the way this works. We know the following about Rangakutta, second order Rangakutta, or fourth order Rangakutta. When you solve this thing, fourth order Rangakutta says your error drops like delta t to the four. You know this exactly from the theory that developed it. You know the second order Rangakutta goes like order delta t squared. So the way a convergent study works is the following. You first go, OK. And by the way, your delta t that you're picking for this code, you want it to be as big as possible. Why? Because if you make delta t, you cut it in half, your code takes twice as long to solve. Right? You want to take as big a delta t as possible and still have a certain accuracy that you desire. That's going to make your code go faster. And you'll see that you want your code to go fast, especially as we start getting to the next homework where it's two-dimensional solutions of advection diffusion problems where the thing that takes the most time is you hit return and it, it, it's solving a huge problem. And if you make it slow, you're going to not like that very much. Okay. So here's what you do. 
To do a conversion study, first you say, okay, I don't have an exact solution. But somehow, if I solve this problem with some delta t, let's call it delta t star, which is really, really small. All, de all time steps are going to be fairly small, but this is way smaller than you'd ever want to solve it with. You solve the problem with some really tiny delta t, and you say, that is my exact solution. The idea behind OD45 or 23 that we're going to use, a fourth order runga cutter or second order kunga, runga kata, is that when you run these things, as your delta t drops down, you should be getting closer to the solution. Okay? So solve it with a really small delta t. Now, back up a bit, take a much bigger time step, time step delta t, and say, okay, how about now let's solve it with some delta t which is sort of reasonable. Like for instance, maybe this is a delta t of 10 to the negative 5, and then I come back and solve it for 10 to the negative 2. I only have to do this once, and I solve it for 10 to the negative 2. Now the idea is, I can compare this solution with that solution and see what kind of error there is in between these two. This should be more accurate. And what I can do is do a cascade of runs. I can do a delta t. I can cut my I can keep cutting my delta t in half. And what I can do is, as I take this run, and then this run, and then this run, what should be happening is this should be getting progressively more accurate. Because it's smaller and smaller delta t. And these runs should be converging to the solution, which was run at this delta t star. Okay? And you know exactly, actually, how they should be converging. You know that if I have a fourth order under cutta, this thing here should be going like delta t4 down to that solution. Second order under cutta, take this down, it should be converging like L order delta t squared. And the best way probably to actually calculate an error or one standard way is looking at the root mean square error. Let me write it down. What you do is you take your delta t star solution, which is your exact solution, you subtract off your solution to it, okay? And you do it for all the points in your domain. Remember, you discretize this thing, right? You're going to chop it up into a number of points. You're going to discretize the domain. Your solution is going to go from, you know, negative 1 to 1, and you're going to have a certain number of points here. Well, you take the difference, absolute value of the difference, squared of all these different points between your solution at delta t and the solution delta t star, which is the exact solution. Sum those up, divide by the total number of points, square root it. That's it. That's one possible error measurement. There are others. Regardless of what you use, you know that this thing should go like delta t4. Okay? And what you do is you can calculate this error as you step down. The typical rule of thumb is, as you take this down, your solution should not change noticeably. Like, if you look at it on a screen, you shouldn't see any difference. And you should see this thing. You keep track of this error as a function of delta t. So as your delta t gets smaller, this, in fact, should be a curve like, should look like a curve like delta t to the 4, a quartic. The Runga Kata method says. Okay? That gives you a check, like, okay, what I'm seeing is numerically accurate. It's converging. I can have some confidence that if I were to take my results, publish them, it would be right. In the end, since we're all in this room thinking maybe about doing research, you know, in whatever our respective field is, or even working for a company, one thing that you always want to do is be right scientifically about things. Okay? There's not a lot of error for being wrong. So, this is one of these things that is very important. If you're ever in doubt, do the study. Okay? 
Typically what happens if you're not numer numerically resolved, you start stepping it down like this, the behavior changes. Then you know, okay, that was a numerical error. Okay? All right, with that said, so yes? It's an error you're computing for one particular delta t. What's that? It's an error you're computing for one particular delta t. Um, the, the formula that you wrote for 3. That's right, that's right. And then you, you change it to delta t. So like, you know, first it's delta t, then it's delta t. Yeah, exactly. And then delta t over 4. And you keep cal cal calculating this, and it's, it should look something like this. OK. Now, let's come to the computer here. I'm going to try to program in such a way that this will look good. Let me. Uh, I turned off the lights here, and it kind of helped out a little bit. Does that help a little bit more? And then let's go up with my brightness. OK, how's that look up there? Can you guys see that? All right, so I pulled up MATLAB. Now, the idea is I think that most of you should have access to MATLAB through your home departments. So um, get a lab and start playing around with it, and you'll start getting really good quickly when you have to start doing these homeworks. Um, so there's the environment. I picked up the font for you so that everybody could see it. The typical way to sort of program is to, to write a script. Open a, a, what's called a .m file. Program everything in there. And then you run that .m file. And that, that .m file, then you save that. And that's your, thing, that's your code that you can port around. OK? So let's, uh, here, to do this, you can just do file, new, new m file. And that's what I want. Pops up a little, you know, programming window. And so now whatever we write here, this is going to be the code that we can execute. By the way, I should introduce some buttons. This button right here, can you all see that? That is the execute button. Okay. And the execute button will basically, um, you press that, it will save what you have and run the code. Okay. Uh, there's some other ones here, but that's probably the most important. This one uh, right here is the save button. And you, you, know, you see I can run my cursor over it and it says save. OK. So I always like to begin codes with the commands clear all, close all. Clear all wipes the slate clean of everything that's been in there so far. Close all closes all figures down. The reason I like to do this is because suppose you've been working in MATLAB for an hour. Every variable you've defined is still active. And suppose you want to use, hey, I'll define a new variable, x. Well, maybe you did it 45 minutes ago, and you forgot about it. And you did some stuff with x, but it believes x was something else, maybe. Or you maybe filled in a couple components of a vector x, but the vector x was actually something really big, and it's carrying all this around. The point here is that if you've been working in MATLAB a while, maybe you've done some stuff, and you've inadvertently forgot that you had some other things defined this way. And what this ensures is that Everything wipes clean. You start from here. Whatever I define right here, right now, is what happens for the rest of the code. Okay? So it's, it's always a good starting point, I think. Also, close all is nice because then it wipes out the figures. The figures actually take a lot of memory, you know, to hold them up on the screen and keep them there. So just, you know, get rid of them. Let the computer just compute as fast as quickly as possible. All right. With that defined, I'm going to define a tolerance. How accurate? do we want our solution to be? And let's just pick this, 10 to the minus 4. I'm going to calculate these solutions right here. Remember, to this problem right here with these boundary conditions that are going to satisfy this down to 10 to the minus 4. OK? It is arbitrary, but you have to define how arbitrary. I'm pretty happy with 10 to the minus 4. If you want it more, adjust it. If you need it less, adjust that. Okay? It depends upon what your usage is and how accurate you have to be. Now, yes? Yes? So we don't have to write you it down. You don't have to write it down. Okay. Uh, now, at the end of this, remember, we're going to plot five eigenfunctions and five eigenvalues. This is what we're trying to find. I said, you know, we're trying to find the first five beta values and their associated solutions that actually make this work. So in anticipation of this, I'm going to have them all be plotted in different colors. And so this is also learning some nice tricks about plotting, which is, you know, the first time we plot it, it's 
going to be in red. Second time will be in blue. Third time in green. Fourth time in magenta. Quite lovely color. And black, finally. Okay? So this is, I'm defining a vector which is going to contain our colors. Okay, so a lot of little tricks here are going to be really handy tricks that you'll use a lot in the future, I think. So I'm trying to put it all into code as we, as we build it. All right. Now, let's define a value of n0 because that was something we're specifying here in the problem. What is the n0 value? How about 100? That's pretty close to the value you're going to use in the homework. I give you the parameters there to calculate, but it's, it's pretty close to this. I think it's like 96.4 something. Now, given that, we have some choices now to make. Specifically, let's go back to the boundary condition here. The boundary condition states that on the left and on the right, solutions are zero. Now, the shooting method says, okay, start from here, launch to there. That's what you have to do. So when you start from here, remember that my solution is x1, x2. x1 is the solution, and that's the derivative. So what I want to do when I launch is, I know that the solution has to be 0. That has to be 0. But I can adjust my angle, my launch angle. Let's call that A. And A can be whatever. I'm going to show you this. We're going to first do it for one example, and then we're going to, and I'm going to show you why it doesn't matter what A is. Let's just make A equal 1 for right now. That's my launch angle. Now, I made the comment that really what matters here is adjusting beta, not A. And I'll show you that here specifically in a moment. So that's my launch angle. So my initial conditions, x naught, let's call them, is first, I pin it to 0, and I launch it with angle A. These are my two components of the vector. Okay, this is x1, x2. Okay, so this here is pinning the solution. That's its launch angle. That's it. By the way, the semicolons at the end of everything, what they basically do is, is suppress output to the screen. If you don't put them there, everything I type when I run this code is going to pop out on the screen. One thing that will slow a code way down is a lot of stuff being written to the screen. Because what happens if you write a lot of stuff to the screen, it has to flush. It basically has to say, OK, stop the code, come out to the screen, put everything up to it, come back down, then go back down to the chip and do my calculation. What you'd like to do is write a code that never leaves the chip till the very end. Okay? If you leave the chip, the processor, to go do stuff, that's a lot of time. When you flush to the screen, it actually has to go access the screen, do the thing, come back, come back down. Okay? You don't want to do that. All right. Now, we also want to define our span. In this case, the simplified version, we're going from negative 1 to 1. So we put in our, our, our dimensions there. So here, this is what the end naught value is. Here's my launch angle. Here is the initial conditions I'm launching from. And this is, I'm going from negative 1 to 1. So fairly simple. That's, that's sort of the basic setup. Now, before we start programming seriously, what we want to do is say, OK, I have no idea what the behavior of this looks like. I'm going to solve this thing, and I'm trying to find these beta values. But let's say right now, you have no idea what it looks like. What am I, what am I trying to build a code for? I don't even know what to start looking for, or how to even write a routine to start adjusting my launch angle. So let's do that first. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, OK, let me show you the basic structure of solving this differential equation. Here's how it kind of works. What's going to come out, you're going to call a subroutine built into MATLAB called OD45 or OD23, or OD113. There's a bunch of different ODE solvers in here. They correspond to fourth order runger kata, second order runger kata, Adams Bashforth, Adams Moulton. There's a bunch of them in here. Okay, All these ones we talked about and more are built in already to MATLAB. So you don't have to write your own code. Great. Hopefully you're happy about that. Okay, But we're just going to access them. And the way you access them is you say, okay, 
call the subroutine, and I'll show you the, the way you call it here. And what it's going to spit out is the time values it solved it at. The time value is just going from is negative 1 to 1. And it takes a certain number of steps over, right? It picks a delta t. It actually has an adaptive stepping algorithm, which picks the delta t according to some error tolerance, which we will adjust in the homework. But so, for instance, suppose it took time steps of 10 to minus 2, so 0 0.01. Then this t would be negative 1, negative 0 0.99, and then negative 0.98, and then negative 0.97, and so forth, all the way up to 1. So it gives you the values that it actually has solutions at, and this gives you the corresponding solution values. And this y is a vector with two components. The first component, first column, is your x1 values. The second component is your x2 values, which correspond to these things here. Right, I'm solving for this problem here, and I'm solving for these two vectors as a function from negative 1 to 1. The only thing I've got to put in to OE45 is this right here, this right-hand side. I have to make a function file that calls this right-hand side. I'm done. Okay. So let's call this right-hand side, and I think I called it uh, shoot2. Dot. Okay, shoot2.m. So when I say OD45, shoot2, it's going to look for a file called shoot2.m in the same directory. Okay, unless you give it a directory structure, right? You tell it go go up one directory, go over one, and now see this right hand side. But in general, it's in the same directory. Shoot two. The way this works is you say, okay, call shoot two. I'm going to solve this over that span, which is negative one to one, which I've already defined right here. And I'm storing in these initial conditions, which I've already defined. And I'm going to put an empty box there. If you want to adjust the tolerances, the error tolerances that this thing takes, you would put some options there, which you will do in your homework. This is effectively a way to change your delta t, your time stepping. But right now, let's just do the simple case where we don't have that in there. And then what are the parameters we need in there? Well, we need beta and, and not. And then we put semicolon at the end of that. So the way the structure works, it always has to be this way. Call this file, solve it over that range with this initial conditions, with whatever options I want. If you don't want any options, just put that. With these parameters that I'm sending in there. That's it. Okay, So we need a beta value to throw down there. Let's put beta right here, I don't know, 99. For now, we know it's between zero and hundred, right? That's one of the things we said. Between zero and n naught, which is hundred. Yeah. Can we have as many variables as we as we want? To as do many it? variables as yeah. you want. Yes. Okay. Uh, throw in matrices. You know, you, they can be matrices. They can be whatever you want to throw in there. You throw in there, and then what you have to do is when you read them at shoot two dot m, you have to read in the same variables. Yeah. So, okay. So let's open another file. So let's file save this one as. Uh, we'll call this one. Shoot. And I'm saving it in temp. Okay. And by the way, you run MATLAB in the same directory you're in where these files are. So, and then we'll open a new file, new M file. The way this works now is when you get this right hand side function, it's a function that you're calling, shoot2. And this function is trying to calculate the right hand side. So, right hand side is the variable it's going to return. We do the calculation of what we're trying to calculate here, and that's what it's going to return to the main code. And this is called shoot2. And what comes in here is basically the same order. X span, I'll call X, dummy, beta, and not. So what this is, so now you don't need to put X shoot. It's calling shoot2. It's over this range with this initial condition, but now in here, x is no longer just the initial condition. It starts off as an initial condition, but what x is, is the value of the solution as I go from negative 1 to 1. Okay? Dummy, I just put in there because we don't, we didn't send any extra options in. So typically you just leave it there. I just call it dummy because it's a dummy variable. We're not going to do anything with it. Beta and then not, those are the things we send in. 
Now once I have those, I can now basically build this right hand side. So all I need to do is, the right hand side of this thing is what? Well, let's look at it here. This is it right here. It's the whole right hand side. Zero, so if you, if you do this multiplication out, what does this become? This vector x is x1, x2. If I multiply this out, I have 0 times x1, and then 1 times x2. So I have just x2. And then I have this, x1 times this, x2 times this. So I just get beta n minus n naught x1. Sorry. It's my whole right-hand side. So all I have to do here is reproduce that, which is to say, OK, in that case, then I have the second component of x is my first is the, is the top row of my of my vector there, and the next next row down is beta minus n naught times first component of x. That's it. It's my whole right hand side. I'm just following basically exactly what we have there on the board. Program it in here. So x remember is a vector in the code here. This variable x has two components. To access the two components, I just use an index. x1 acts as the first component, x2 acts as the second component. That's it. So I can save this file. Save as shoot2.m, yep. So the name here, shoot2, is often good to have as the name of the file and also what you call from the other routine. So now, I've done it. I've come in here, I've solved this thing, and now the question is, what does it look like? So we can plot it. Plot t versus, now y itself, this has is a vector with two columns. In the first column is the values of x1, solved from negative 1 to 1. In the second column is the values of x2, from negative 1 to 1. x1 corresponds to what I'm actually looking for, size n. X2 corresponds to its derivative. So all I want to do is look at this. Because this is the only thing I have to impose boundary conditions on. Okay? So let's look at it. So that is the first column. So what you can do is say, let's plot y. The way that you index is rows, columns. <coughs> rows, comma, columns. So I want the first column, I want all of the rows. So that's what the colon does. <coughs> OK? So when I do that, and let's go ahead and up here to the button and run it. And let's see what we get. Boom. There's what I got. <coughs> Does everybody see that OK? With beta equals 0.99, oops, OK, we're both, we're, there we go. What I get is a solution that starts at 0, comes up, and at 1, it ends up here at about 0.9. You can't read that too well from where you're sitting. Now, here's something interesting. You say, oh, well, I should just adjust my launch angle, right? That's what you would normally say, is if I do this, maybe if I cut my launch angle in half, maybe I'll get closer. Maybe this thing will turn around. OK, so remember what the value is, just a little bit above 0.9. So all I have to do is say, OK, let's adjust the launch angle, half it is A, boom, run it again, and there you go. Same plot, except that this isn't point now, it's now just a little bit above 0.45. All it did was cut that in half. If I double it, it's going to be around 1.8. You want to see? So now instead of going to this 2, double it, same graph, just a little bit of above 1.8. So fundamentally, A does not change the behavior. Okay, The only way to make it go to 0, make this thing go to 0, is if I take A equals 0. But if A is equal to 0, that means my initial condition is 0, 0. That gives me back the 0 solution, which I don't want. Now here's something else to watch, though. Let's go back to here. Let's go back to changing this to 1. And let's drop it down to 95. So I change beta. What do I get? 
Very different behavior. So before, it came up and landed up here. Now it's landed down here. And in fact, between 99 and 95 then, it went through zero, didn't it? So I know there is a beta value somewhere between 99 and 95 where this thing should creep down and hit zero. So it's good news. So I already now have a search algorithm I can do. I can start it at like 99 and step it down from 99 to 98 to 90. And as soon as I cross over, I can go back up and start zeroing in on what the right value of beta has to be to make this thing work. Okay? In fact, that's what we're going to do. So we say, okay, how about the following? Now here's something interesting, by the way. So at 95, so when we ran this thing with 95, right, um, this is what this came down to here. Now watch what happens. Let me go even lower. 90. It starts coming back up. So I've just, so I keep, so one thing that's very important. When I was above 99, it was coming down this way. So as, as, I, lowered, as I lowered beta, it dropped down to zero. But then once I got below that, when I lowered beta, it went up to zero. This is going to be an important distinction. In the one hand, for the first mode, if I lower beta, this comes down. On the other, for the next mode, if I lower beta, this comes up. The next one's going to be down, and then up, and then down, and then up. And you'll see why this is when we get the structure of the modes. But this is an important observation. Notice, we have not built a solution yet for this thing. All we've been doing, and this is always a very key thing to do, is we've been looking at the, what did this equation do, first of all. Let's just solve it, see what the behavior is, before you start building the algorithm. Because if you don't even know what's going to sort of happen in this thing, it's, you're, you're doing it blindly. You don't know what to look for. Now you're getting an idea of how to write a routine that is going to systematically go through and nail all your beta values. Okay? So that's what we want to do next. All right, so we have this basic structure. Now we're going to say, okay, let's uh, get rid of this for a moment, and let's start thinking about how to build a, a basic structure around here. We know that changing A doesn't change things, so now we can say, let's look for five beta values. So um, we'll, call, we'll call them five modes. For every for statement, there's an end. So I'm going to go through this thing and look for five different modes of solutions. Okay? Now, I have to give it an initial starting value for beta. So beta start, let's call it that, was 99. I know if I start 99 and start going down, it's going to come and hit the solution. Okay? So as I lower it from 99, I get my first solution. I lower it some more, I get my second solution. I lower it some more, I get my third solution fourth solution and so forth. So I'm going to start off with 99 and start dropping it. So my beta value to start with is going to be uh, this beta start value of 99. Okay. Now, in addition to that, I have to tell it how big a steps I want it to take in beta. I remember, I, I took beta 99, then I took 95. So I jumped four values. Well, how about if I, I know that beta has to be between 0 and 100. Why don't we just take the d beta, in other words, how, how much am I going to lower beta every time to take a look at this when I do this code, right? I started off 99 and went 95. What if I just did it, I don't know, from 0 to, I just did 1, like 99, 98. I just did it systematically like that. Okay. So I could say my d beta is equal to 1. For convenience, I don't. There's nothing special about this value. Okay, but that's how it's going to lower. It's going to start at 99 and go down to 98, 97, 96, 95 until I go too far down. Then it's going to go back up. I want to zero in on it. Okay. Now, once I have that, now I've set up this as the basic stuff. I want to say, okay, now I'm going to do a loop. It's actually going to start slicing this thing up. It's going to start adjusting the, the beta values to actually converge onto this thing. So this loop, all it's doing right now is going to go through the loop five times, 
try to find five beta values. And what now we're going to do is say, okay, now let's start slicing and dicing to converge to this thing. And I'm going to adjust, what this is going to do, I'm going to go through a loop up to a maximum of a thousand times. It's going to go one, for J it goes one to a thousand, so it's going to one, two, three, all the way up to a thousand. I'm going to allow my search to be up to a thousand iterations. I'm going to go through this thing, slide, and I'm going to just keep searching for this new beta value that's going to make this work, but a maximum of a thousand times. If it hasn't found it a thousand times, give up. Okay? But the idea is it should start converging to the tolerance we need, and then quit. All right. So here's what it's going to do. First thing it's going to do, it's going to come into the loop, it's going to solve the, it's going to come into the loop, it's going to go solve the problem. Now, what do we do when we, after we solve the problem? We have to say, am I above or below where I'm supposed to be, or did I hit it? This is the critical step right here. This is where the logic comes in, determines what the next beta value has to be. Okay? So you can do the following. If the absolute value of Let me explain this in a moment here. What this first thing does is says, okay, this piece of logic simply says, look, y end one. What this is, is this is y, it's the first column. End means the last component. So go to the first column, last component. What is that? Well, if you look at what the first column is, it's this x1, which is this psi of n. And I've solved it from here to here. So that my last value in the first column is supposed to be at 0. So what I'm asking, is it, in fact, close to 0? Remember, a tolerance is what I picked to say what the accuracy was. So I'm saying, look, take the last value, psi of n, that's supposed to be what this is supposed to be the value of this thing over at x equal one. What happens when it goes to zero and comes back, back up? You're going to get two zero values, so I want to give you. Ah, but this is only one. asking about the very last one of the zero values. Okay. It's not asking about anything. What happens in between? He doesn't care about. All it cares about is what's the value over there. That's what the end comment says. Is that this is a basically a big vector of data, and you're saying what's the value over here? Is it at zero or not? It can go through zero here as many times as you want it to. It doesn't matter. Okay? That's the first question. Now, if it, if it did do that, print out the beta value and just quit. You're done. You've got a solution. Yeah? Since we know we're going to hit the zero value in this problem, wouldn't it be cleaner to put a while loop? Ah, until well, we until don't. The only problem, I, so the while loop is good. The only problem with the while loop is if you're programming and you have a, 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 a bug, yeah, know it will it never it stops. Yeah, yeah. So really typically, I know that I'm going to hit this thing mm -hmm. probably within 30 iterations. I've picked going through a thousand times. Usually, it's like 25 to 30. The only reason I do for loops as opposed to while loops is that I know this will stop. Yeah. I know that it will stop, and otherwise, I don't have to go. Well, is it still running? Is it, I don't know. I mean, should I break it? It stays busy, and then you, and then, so I know if I've hit J equals a thousand, it, it didn't do anything. Okay. So that's the only reason I would I use that instead. Now let me do this last p piece of code here, which is now you do the logic. Now you can ask the following question: If, however, this value is bigger than zero, remember if it was bigger than zero, what do we have to do? We have to keep lowering beta. So you say, okay, how about beta is equal to what it was before minus d beta. However, if it was, however, if it was the opposite of that, so in other words, if my beta value is too high, keep lowering it. But all of a sudden, if I go too far, I'm actually going to go back up. I've gone too far. So we can say, is okay, how about beta is then but instead of going all the way back up, let's just go halfway back up. You know it's between those two. And then you can say d beta now is d. So what this does, 
this little logic here. It says, look, if my solution's too high, lower the beta value. However, if I've already gone past it, I've got to raise my value back up. But instead of going all the way back up, which I already know is too high, go up halfway. And then ask the question again, do I need to go up further or do I need to go down? And then you start seeing that this here is simply a bisection method. Keep cutting the d beta in half until it zeroes in on what it needs to be. Okay? Now one last piece of code that I want to add, and then the rest of it I'll let you guys play with uh, later, is the following. <coughs> this statement was only true for the first mode. I lower beta if I'm too high. But for the second mode, I was going the opposite way. Remember? I was coming down and coming up on it. So in order to sort of fix that, all I have to do is say, okay, I'm going to go opposite, so just do the following. Oops. All this does is makes a sign change. So when modes was 1, the first time through the loop, I have 1 plus 1, this is squared, negative 1 squared is 1. So all it says, if this is 1, then it says, if it's too high, lower it. But, if on the second mode, now it's the second mode I'm looking for in the loop, now modes is 2, this is 2 plus 1, it's 3, negative 1, is this is a negative sign. So if this thing is negative, lower the value of beta. See how it switches? Because the first mode you look for is you lower beta, it comes down. The other mode you look for as you lower beta, it comes up. And what this accounts for is that change. This basic routine right here will basically go through and systematically find modes for you. The only thing you have to do at the end of this thing is once you find a mode, start looking for the next mode with a beta value that's lower than that. And then you go through and find the five modes. It's all in the code. Or it's, sorry, the code is all in the notes. So what I encourage you to do, go ahead and take a look at what's in the notes, program that up, take a look at what it gives you as results. Okay? Your homework will be very similar to that.